Hello, I'm Jack Koenig with Graco Industrial Lubrication Equipment, and today I have the Lube Pro A4000 reciprocating grease pump. It's hooked up to a bank of 100 GL32 injectors. Let's see how quickly the injectors fire, and then let's take a look at how quickly they vent. And as a note, the grease in this is a lithium number two grease. That's what I filled the reservoir with, and I also purged all my lines, got all the air out, got all the grease that used to be in there out, so now everything's this number two grease. Let's see how it does. This first row, the pins popped out pretty quickly. Our pressure's up to 2,500 PSI. The second row, the pins are out already. The pressure's at 2,000 PSI. But down here on the third row, the pins are out, but we're only seeing 1,500 PSI. These pins are out, and now this one's approaching 1,500 PSI. And now down on the bottom, the pins are popping out, and it's approaching 1,000 PSI. So, if you've ever heard people talk about pressure drop or pressure loss, you can look at these gauges and see the differences between 2,500 PSI, 2,000 PSI, 1,500 PSI, 1,500 PSI here now too, as this one continues to climb. And that one was about 1,000. But you can see through all this 3 8 tubing and, th and 3 8 hoses, that the pressure is dropping a few hundred PSI through each stage. All of our injectors have fired, but the pump is still pumping because the controller hadn't yet received the signal from the pressure switch. That last sound was the pressure switch, excuse me, the last sound was the vent valve opening because the pressure switch had finally tripped on the controller. So here you can see the light is still on because that pressure is still there. The pressure signal is still coming back to the controller on our GLC 4400 and it's venting now but we can go at, look at this in reverse this gauge doesn't show any pressure this one's showing about 400 psi this one about five or six hundred this one about 700 and this one still shows about 800 psi so you can see as we go through these stages that the pressure drop is a huge factor in these situations, especially with a number two grease, three eighths inch line. If this was quarter inch line, the grease would hardly be moving. These pins have all popped back inside. These pins are inside too to show all these injectors have reset. Just now the last one in this row did. This row, they're all still out. In the bottom row, they're all still out. So let's fast forward through time now and see how long it takes for all of these injectors to reset. A couple of minutes have passed and now there are just two injectors left in this row that haven't reset and the first couple of injectors in this row, this one and this one have reset and so they're starting to get the last ones to reset now. Let's fast forward in time again and see how long it takes to get them all completely reset. Oh, this one just popped in, so we only have one more in this row. Okay, it's been a couple more minutes. And right here in this bank of four, the last couple are just finishing their reset. This gauge actually still shows 400 PSI on the gauge. And when we come back here, this one's still about 350. This one's about 250. This one's still showing about 100 PSI. And then this one isn't showing anything, but it still may have 50 PSI or so on it because I don't know how true that zero is on that gauge when it's a 5,000 PSI gauge probably doesn't have that close of, res of uh, resolution. One thing that could be done to improve the design of this set of, of uh, excuse me, of injectors would be to do one main line that these all branch off of. Instead of routing the grease through every single manifold, you can see how it really choked down that bank of injectors even the most. 
and I'm also actually assisting the resetting because I have three GL11s down here that help everything reset a little faster. So let's take a look now with the GL11s not connected to the system. I'm gonna close this ball valve here. Let's run it again now with the GL11s isolated and just purely the 100 GL32 injectors. Once again, these injectors fired really rapidly. These ones fired pretty quickly too. Actually, all the injectors have pretty much fired now. And this guy is bouncing up to about 3,000 PSI. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I have about 100 PSI air supplied to this pump. So even though it's a 40 to one pump, we're seeing some pressure loss right away where we're seeing about 3,000 PSI on the gauge on the outlet side of this pump. This gauge shows 2,800 PSI. This one shows 2,700 PSI. This one shows 2,600 PSI. This one about 2,500 and this one almost 2,500 as well. So now my pressure switch is also isolated so I'm gonna have to manually cancel this. Okay, these ones are already venting. Now these ones These have all vented as of, well, nope, there's still a few left. Okay, there, now these have all vented. There's still a few more in this row. A couple of them, a couple of them have vented in this row, but most of them have not yet. And all these ones down here, these last two rows, nothing has vented yet. So when we look at our pressure here, zero pressure, about 350 PSI, 450 PSI, about 600 PSI, and this one's still about 700 PSI. Okay, this row is done venting. This row is just starting to vent. So one of the things I wanted to demonstrate in this video was that it's not a straight line for how long it takes these injectors to vent. It's more like a J curve, where if we actually plotted this out on a graph for how long it takes the injectors to vent versus which bank they're in, it's gonna be exponentially longer for each bank. Because if you remember this one, it fired and it vented right away. This one did it pretty quickly after that for both the firing and the venting. But then this one took quite a bit longer time. This one is still working on it a lot longer time. And then this row is gonna take the longest. And if you have a system that's designed where you have a lot of bottlenecks or just use too small of tubing in general, it might take a full hour sometimes for the grease to vent, for, for that pressure to vent through the grease, if it ever does. Sometimes grease, because of the way grease properties are, the way it sticks atropic, it can have enough shear strength that it actually prevents the venting forever, where until some big vibration or some other kind of impact breaks up and shears the grease, it's just gonna sit there and hold pressure indefinitely. So it's very important to make sure you're using a line size that's big enough. Every so often I get a call, can I use this pump to pump grease 100 feet? Well, sure, the pump can probably push grease 100 feet. For instance, a G3, if you put a high enough pressure relief on it, a G3 can pump out 5,000 PSI. You can push grease pretty far. But then what really matters is the metering device that you're using. And I wanted to show this with the GL32s because they have the weakest spring of all the injectors. Whereas the, the GL11s and the GL1s, they have a, a spring that's about three times as strong as the GL32s. So even the line size, if you're used to GL1s, the line size kind of rule of thumb or whatever experience you have with GL1s doesn't apply to GL32s because their springs are so much weaker. Okay, this row has one left yet, and this row is just starting to vent. So again, I was jabbering away for a while there, and th these ones are here just now getting around to venting. We still have almost 500 PSI right here. And this is again without the GL11s helping vent. They're isolated, so they're not able to help get the grease moving. 
The reason that the, having the GL1 or GL11 at the end of the line is helping is because I was just mentioning about the grease shear, where once grease gets moving, its viscosity drops. So when it's gelatinous, grease has one viscosity, but when it's flowing, the viscosity is much lower than it is when it's stationary. So once you get that grease moving, it's easier for injectors to reset as the grease flows past them than it is when it's just sitting there. And so now these guys, these last few here are just resetting now. And it seems like it's about the same amount of time as it took with the GL1s, excuse me, with the GL11s, because I haven't actually been timing it. But having a bigger injector at the end will help ensure that your smaller injectors are able to fire even at some of these longer runs. So you should never design a system to need that. But if you ever set up a system with GL32s and it won't reset because maybe the tubing's too small or the grease is too heavy or whatever, you can put a GL1 or a GL11 at the end and the stronger spring at the end there will get the grease moving to vent and help them all vent a little more quickly or maybe they weren't venting at all and now they will vent. The other thing is if you do a GL1 system and it doesn't work, as long as your hose or tubing is strong enough, you could put a GL1X or GL1XL on the end of the GL1 or GL11 system because the X and XL have a spring that's even stronger than the one and the 11. So that's another, you can still use that same trick with those bigger injectors by using the X and XL injectors to get that grease moving and then allow all the in other injectors between that injector and the pump to reset as well. Hopefully this all makes sense and hopefully you could kind of see what was going on here. I know I have the camera back away because I'm trying to show a lot, but I just wanna kind of help people understand the concept of the way the dynamic is inside of a really long piece of tubing with, with a heavy grease and trying to get your injectors to fire and reset. You just gotta make sure that you have a big enough piece of tubing, a wide enough tube that is, and that you have enough time to allow your injector at the end of a longer run to go ahead and reset in the time you need it. So if you have any questions about this, feel free to contact us. We're always happy to hear from you. Thanks.